Brother Michael's sermon text this evening can be found in Revelation chapter 22, verse 5. And there shall be no night there, and, and they need no candle, neither light of the sun. For the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. This is uh, in John's vision of the holy city, the new Jerusalem. This verse, Revelation 22, 5, is the last verse of the description that he gives in his vision. After this follows, there's some other statements, but as far as just the description of the city itself, this is the last verse. And once again, this matter of light comes up. This has been brought up in previous verses, which we're going to read. <clears throat> so the, the Holy Spirit is bringing this up. This is like a, something the Holy Spirit wants us to get, to see this. That's why he brings it up. So when we look at light here, we're not just, we're not just talking about like the light that emanates from, from our light bulbs or, or from the sun or the moon. This is, this is a, a certain kind of light that we're talking about here. <clears throat> It's not just so that you can see clearly. It's not light just so that you can be warm and comfortable. It's more than just that there will be no need for sleep. More than just a cessation. More than just that there will not be a cessation of profitable service to God. Although all those things are true, the light in John's vision of the New Jerusalem serves to represent something much greater than just those things. <clears throat> so this is a prominent theme. It's mentioned several times and is repeated uh, <clears throat> back in chapter 21, verse 11. It says, Having the glory of God and her light was like unto a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. And again, in verses chapter 21, verses 23 and 24 and 25, all three of those, light is the, the central issue. The city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. And the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it. And the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it. And the gates of it shall not be shut at all by day, for there shall be no night there. Now, if you love light, then you can't help but notice what John says about it in this vision. <clears throat> this, this, will, this will repeatedly get your attention. So this is light that will minister good things to your spirits. <clears throat> it's the light will, that will draw you to itself and arouse a greater appetite and desire for this particular light. <clears throat> this is the light that we're looking for. Amen. This is the city that Abraham was looking for, and he was looking for it because of this light. <clears throat> Therefore, in this last descriptive verse of the holy city, the Holy Spirit speaks this one more time. This is like, this is the last descriptive verse and this is the main thing again like the Holy Spirit saying are you getting this do you understand what I'm saying about the city here do you, are you do you get it do you comprehend it let's let's review it again <clears throat> Jesus would say let these sayings sink down into your ears <clears throat> and there shall be no night there and they need no candle neither light of the sun <clears throat> Now here in this world, we have to become accustomed to night and to darkness, at least to some extent. <clears throat> Every 24 hours or so, night comes, whether you like it or not. That's just the way it is. <clears throat> so, and while we live in this world, we also, this is, we're living in the domain of the prince of this world, who is also, darkness is one of his, uh, one of the things that he employs. He, he loves darkness and his children love darkness and night more than the light. <clears throat> the course of this world is according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. So as long as this world stands, now that's the, that's the course of this world. <clears throat> that's just the way it is, which is why it's slated to be destroyed. Both natural darkness and spiritual darkness are going to be obliterated in due time, but for the present, 
dealing with darkness as part of living in this world. Darkness, just on a, a kind of a simple level, darkness is just the absence of light. <clears throat> darkness can only come because the light has left or because clouds have come in and obscured the light. <clears throat> we live in a dark world and a dark time. As the, the day of the Lord gets closer and closer, the people of God sense this. It's, it's like the darkness is increasing. If it, you know, in, the, in nature, you'll, I used to work the midnight shift for many years, and you'll notice this whenever, just before the sun starts coming up, that's when it's darkest. That's when the temperature is the lowest. It gets the coldest and darkest. You know, if the sun never came up, it'd just continue to get darker and colder. But praise God, the sun comes up every morning. <clears throat> but this is the nature, the spiritual nature of things in this world. Now, as we get closer and closer to the day of the Lord, it's getting darker and darker, more and more wicked. <clears throat> so these are things that we have to deal with. <clears throat> Night <clears throat> is a is when evil works most successfully. Night is the thing that those who hate God love. <clears throat> Hidden things, dishonesty and deception are associated with night. Judas went out from the supper and betrayed our Lord at night. Jesus was arrested in the garden at night, and he was tried of the chief priests and elders at night. And when he was on the cross, darkness covered the face of the land for three hours. <clears throat> Unfruitful works of darkness are done in the night. Night is darkness. If the sun's shining, we don't say it's night. Night is when the light is gone. Night is when we are no longer able to work. There can be <clears throat> very little or no progress in the night. Night also coincides with the weariness of our flesh. It's when everything slows down, at least, or in most cases comes to a complete halt at nighttime. <clears throat> Sleeping is done at night. Sleeping and drunkenness are in the night. Therefore, we exhorted, are exhorted to watch and be sober as those who are children of the light and children of the day. According to Isaiah 47, 42 and verse 7, having blind eyes and sitting in darkness are associated with being in a prison house. Spiritual darkness is a prison house from which there is no escape. <clears throat> Such persons must be rescued, delivered, and redeemed by the grace of God. <clears throat> and a lot of weeping is done in the night. Amen. A lot of prayers go up to God in the night. Sometimes our deficiencies and our needs are uh, made a lot more apparent to us at the night time. And as precious as these times can be, we are glad that... Uh, these things are temporary because the saints would rather have light all the time. <clears throat> we long for the light. Fears can come upon us <clears throat> and be amplified at night. Therefore, a lot of waiting and hoping is done in the night seasons. This is uh, expressed in the 130th Psalm, verse 5. I wait for the Lord. My soul doth wait, and in his word do I hope. My soul waiteth for the Lord more than they that watch for the morning. Mm -hmm. I say more than they that watch for the morning. Amen. In this psalm, they that watch for the morning, now obviously they're watching in the nighttime. <clears throat> they are foregoing sleep. They're anxiously awaiting the time when the sun rises up and breaks forth on the darkness. In the darkness, there are enemies who may be approaching unseen. Arrows can fly out of the darkness. <clears throat> in the night, the enemy can be very close without being detected. Yet he's sensed, even though not seen, he's sensed by the righteous. So we long for the daytime. <clears throat> Vexation, anxiety, and even fear can come over us in the night. Unwanted and unsettling dreams can come upon us in the night. When day comes, then all is clearer. Sometimes the day is actually more restful for us than the night. The enemies of our souls, in the daytime, the enemies can be seen from afar off, and you can, you can pick them off early, so to speak, in the daytime while the light's shining. But now the psalmist here says that he's longing and waiting for the Lord more than they that watch for the morning. 
So this is a very strong expression, a strong longing and waiting. <clears throat> He's in a nighttime that's common to the people of God. He expresses this in the first verse of Psalm 130. Out of the depths have I cried unto thee, O Lord. Now this will never be expressed in the world to come. Now there will be, there is going to be darkness somewhere for eternity, but not where the saints abide. Jude says that those who turn the grace of God into lasciviousness and deny God and his Christ are raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame, wandering stars to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. But now that's not the holy city. That's another place. <clears throat> John's vision confirms to us that all the saints will have what we long for. There will be no alternations of light and darkness, no cycles of near and far, no ups and downs, no more work, rest, work, rest, work, rest, light and darkness, no more seeing and then not seeing, no more fear then comfort, no more weeping, then joy, no more prayers and intercessions, then thanksgiving, no more depths, then heights, no more valleys before the mountaintops, no more ebb and flow, no more waiting and hoping in darkness for the light to shine again. There shall be no night there. When the nighttime is gone, then the nighttime experiences are gone. In the holy city, the eternal constancy of light abides that eternal light indicates for us eternal safety unending faithful efficient service to God that light that John saw in the city indicates to us that all things will be seen clearly for as long as the light shines and it will shine forever it indicates also the eternal loving kindness and the exceeding riches of God's grace poured upon his saints it indicates that there will never be a reason for fear, never a need, never a prayer or intercession, never a request for more supplies from another place that's better, that's far away. It indicates also to the saints of God complete absence of the enemies of the people of God. In such a glorious city where flows the river of water of life proceeding from the throne of God and the Lamb, and where there is the tree of life with its healing leaves and its fruit, which it bears all the time. <clears throat> and there is no more curse, and the throne of God and the Lamb is there, and they shall see his face, and his name is in their foreheads, and there is no night there. The saints will be well supplied in the world to come to minister to him at full capacity forever. And what a capacity we will have in our resurrection bodies. <clears throat> and they need no candle, neither light of the sun. This is a small light and a large light. We are familiar with both of these. And we need, we have electric lights now, but there are still a lot of parts of the world they don't have electricity, and they still use the candles and the lamps. Which you need that when the sun goes down. <clears throat> you need the smaller light when the, the, the sun's not replaceable. There's not, there's not another sun. We've got the moon, but other than that, in, in, your, in your dwelling place, when the sun goes down, you need to get out an artificial light. Uh -huh. You need to light a candle. <clears throat> uh, so when light's gone, men, men inject artificial light into the darkness. <clears throat> but the candle's certainly no replacement for the sun. The candle only lights the immediate surroundings, and really rather dimly. <clears throat> The candle lights a small area. It doesn't provide light for all the details unless you get up really close. with. So it's portable. You can hold a candle in your hand, and it, you, ha you have to carry it with you if you're moving about the house because it won't light up the whole house. <clears throat> you certainly can't grow crops with the light of a candle. right? You've got to have the sun for that. <clears throat> it doesn't provide much in the way of heat unless it's a very small space. <clears throat> The candle slowly melts away until it's of no use anymore. And we, we know it. That's We light the candle. We know it's not going to last forever. It's just temporary until the sun rises again. <clears throat> and then morning comes and sun lightens everything again. <clears throat> but when the sun comes back, <clears throat> even the things in the shadows 
are seen for what they are in the daytime. Uh -huh. In the daytime, you can see in the shadows, where in the nighttime, you can't. <clears throat> the sun provides a light that is unparalleled in this world. It provides a unique warmth and energy that sustains life all around the world. There are vast fields of vegetation and forests that grow in the light of the sun. Light shining in streams and rivers and oceans sustains life. <clears throat> so the light of the sun is very highly valued on earth. <clears throat> but it too is temporary. <clears throat> the people of God have no need for either candle or sun in the holy city. Whether it's on the personal level or on the grand scale, we have no need for either of those lights. <clears throat> They're made obsolete, obsolete for two reasons given in our text here. For one, there shall be no night there, and also because the Lord God giveth them light. The people of God will never again experience any kind of darkness, not even for the shortest moment of time, because the eternal presence of God and the Lamb will always shine on them. He will be the light of each individual person, yet he will also give light all around on the grand scale. Not that he will give another source of light to replace our candles or our sun, but that the Lord God himself is the light. He is the light that he gives them. The only light in the holy city is the glory of God and the Lamb. That's the light we will have. So here is the message the Holy Spirit is emphasizing again in concerning the matter of light. <clears throat> How is it that the light will always shine? How is it that the darkness will never come again in any form? How is it that in the world to come, God will always be with us, and we will never again experience God hiding himself from us? Now, we experience these things in the present time, but not there. How can the Lord God give us the full light of his glory uninterrupted forever? Here's what the Holy Spirit's saying. It's because he can. Because in this city, he can, where he can't do that here. <clears throat> this, this is the temple that Jesus built for God. This is his habitation. This is the bride, the lamb's wife. How could it be anything else? This is fitting for God. This is the working of the lamb of God and the Lord's Christ from eternity past up until the present time. We have no indication that there has ever been another city like this, a habitation prepared just for the Godhead to dwell in the fullness of their glory. Not only a habitation made of redeemed men, but also the bride of Christ, glorified with Christ, made to faithfully represent and please Jesus Christ as his co-heirs, and also to minister as fully equipped servants and children of God in whatever he does in the ages to come. Amen. Now he says <clears throat> several times in this, uh, the first few verses of chapter 22, he says they, the words they, there, and them are used. <clears throat> I want to establish just, you know who they are, but we want to establish who they are. <clears throat> Verse 24 says, and they shall see his face and his name shall be in their foreheads. And verse 25, there shall be no night there, and they need no candle, neither light of the sun, for the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. Now they began back in verse 3, says, and his servants shall serve him. That's, that's who they are. It's his servants. <clears throat> Those who serve him are those who shall see his face and those who will have his name in their foreheads. Those are the ones who have no need of the candle nor light of the sun. For the Lord God giveth them light and they shall reign. His servants shall reign forever and ever. <clears throat> now this is, how, this is how eternity begins. This is not like something that will gradually grow into. This is how it starts. And this is how it will remain for all eternity. <clears throat> it begins in the light and will continue in the light forever and ever. <clears throat> I couldn't help but think of this foolish saying. I know you've all heard this. I'd rather rule in hell than serve in heaven. I've heard men say that 
they could not possibly be more wrong. There will be no one to serve in the lake of fire, and there will be no service that's possible. Mm -hmm. All the reigning is going to be done by God's servants, mm -hmm. that's those who serve him here, and they shall reign forever and ever. Amen. When you think of reign, this is much more than like a figurehead, <clears throat> where uh, maybe someone is crowned king or queen, but they don't really serve in any kind of capacity other than just that we have this king or queen. That's not the kind of reign we're talking about here. <clears throat> reign is an action word. This is a verb. <clears throat> when we reign, we not only have authority, but we employ our authority in the service of God. When we reign, we not only have wisdom and discretion, but we use wisdom and discretion in service to God. Not only do we have power, but our power is exerted for the glory of God. Under the headship of our bridegroom, Christ Jesus, the saints are going to dominate the world to come forever and ever. Amen. We will prevail in all matters over which we have been given, and as I understand it, that's everything. The inheritance is all ours. The servants of God will rule over everything in the ages to come. <clears throat> So why reign for the glory of God? Because he's the one that gave it to us. That's the only, that's the only reigning that is going to exist is for the glory of God. <clears throat> reigning with Christ cannot possibly be used for any other purpose but to, glory, to, but to the glory and honor of God who gave it to us. So serving God in the world to come is all there is. <clears throat> there are no other agendas, and we praise God for it. <clears throat> There will be no distraction. There will be no thieves of time <clears throat> and attention like there are now. To serve God is to reign with Christ. And Christ is going to reign forever and ever. And those who sit with him in his throne must reign forever and ever too. Our time in this world is practice ground for this reign. <clears throat> now you can, there's... A lot that you can't reign over right now, but there are some things you can. You can, you can say, get under me, body. Right. Hands, feet, ears, mouth, join together and let us serve him who gave himself for us. Right. Mind, soul, strength, put on the whole armor of God and take the high ground. Mm -hmm. Cast down wicked thoughts and imaginations. Resist the devil. Mm -hmm. Find the way of escape. Don't let sin reign over us. These are all exhortations to reign in the present time <clears throat> with the limited light that we have been given. But we do certainly have light now. <clears throat> For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in an earthen vessel, <clears throat> in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. But now, to contrast that with the holy city, in the holy city, the light won't shine out of darkness. It will just shine. <clears throat> and we won't have any earthen vessels to deal with, but bodies like unto his glorious body. The Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. I like that. Not just forever, but forever and ever. So this is not an exaggeration now. This, this isn't like a, a pretty ending to a fairy tale, forever and ever. No, this is, these are the words of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit doesn't, doesn't play with words like men do. This, this means forever and ever. <clears throat> They'll reign forever and ever. <clears throat> Actually, I was surprised. I looked this up, and I was surprised to find how many times this phrase is found in Scripture, forever and ever. The vast majority of time, it's, a, it's applied to God himself. <clears throat> there are a few exceptions. <clears throat> but the servants of God shall also reign in immortality. Now, this is what's been brought to light through the gospel, right? Life and immortality has been brought to light through the gospel. This is what the people of God seek by their patient continuance and well-doing. This is what Daniel prophesied of in chapter 7, verse 18. But the saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom 
and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. Yeah, get the point there? Forever, even forever and ever. And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. That's Daniel 12, 3. These scriptures are, really, this is such a refreshing thing to hear compared to what is popularly and commonly taught today, isn't it? <clears throat> I think uh, this premillennial doctrine is so prominent, <clears throat> and I, it's been remarkable to me of all the times I've read things that men have written and heard uh, premillennialists speak, not, in, in my memory, not one single time have I ever heard any of them talk about forever. It's always you know, the thousand years. We'll reign with Christ a thousand years. But it was like, what after, what's after that? And they don't have anything to say anymore. They can talk all about uh, the terrible things coming on the earth and the Antichrist and the mark of the beast and, and maybe a little bit about reign with Christ. But, well, what after that? What happens after that? I want to hear about forever and ever. Amen. Well, now this is, this is the true gospel we're hearing tonight. This is, this is what John wrote about forever and ever. <clears throat> and the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven, saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of the Lord and his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Not just a thousand years. <clears throat> And in our text, the Holy Spirit plainly states that the servants of God shall reign forever and ever. <clears throat> now, this is exactly the case that Paul also presents in the epistle to the Hebrews in chapter 2. For unto the angels hath he not put in subjection the world to come, whereof we speak. Now, we're speaking about the world to come, just to clarify. But one in a certain place testified, saying, What is man? that thou art mindful of him, <clears throat> or the son of man, that thou visitest him. Thou madest him a little lower than the angels. Thou crownest him with glory and honor, and didst set him over the works of thy hands. Mm -hmm. now, again, we're talking about the world to come, the, the work of his hands. We're not talking about this world. We're not talking about uh, the, the creation and the, the Garden of Eden and the animals and the trees. We're talking about the world to come. He set him over the works of his hands <clears throat> and has put all things in subjection under his feet. For in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. It's still talking about man, right? But now we see not yet all things put under him. You, you, you experience that on a moment-by-moment -moment basis, that everything's not under your authority right now. <clears throat> At present, there are a great number of things that the people of God have no dominion over. We have not received the inheritance yet. All things are not subject to us yet. <clears throat> we are not yet in the new heavens and the new earth. We have not received our resurrection bodies yet. So then what example do we have? What, what guarantee do we have that this is going to come to pass, that, uh, that men are going to be over everything in the world to come? But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. For it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things, and bringing many sons unto glory, that's us, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings, for both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. Now, if you weren't going to reign with Christ, he's not going to call you brethren. <clears throat> Those who do not sit with him in his throne are not brethren, but, but he calls you brethren, and he's not ashamed to do it. Amen. Saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. And again, he says, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children which God hath given me. That's the fellowship and communion with Christ, which we have been brought into by the grace of God. Amen. He was made like unto us, and we are going to be made like unto him, Amen. such that he is not ashamed to call us his brethren. 
and the children that God has given him. It is a faithful saying, for if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. So there, those who share in his sufferings here will certainly share in his reign there. These are the ones <clears throat> unto whom the world to come has been put into subjection. They shall reign forever and ever. What John is telling us about in this vision of the holy city <clears throat> is when we have no more earthen vessels and no more will we see through a glass darkly, John is telling us about the face-to-face -face time. When the Lord God himself giveth us light. Amen. This is such a far cry from all the myths and fairy tales we hear about heaven yeah. <clears throat> that are propagated by men today, <clears throat> which really all these things are, these what I've called myths and fairy tales, they're really just the fulfillment of carnal lust. That's, mm -hmm. that's what these things are. You know that... In heaven, there's your whatever your favorite sport is. There's going to be a lot of that there. You like to play golf? Or just heaven just be covered with golf courses, yeah. and all your favorite foods mm -hmm. and this kind of thing. And you're going to have a a mansion there, mm -hmm. a, just a luxurious mansion, lavishly furnished to your specifications, mm -hmm. right there in the street of gold. And yeah. these kind of these are just. And you, then you've got the Muslim and the Mormon who they're. Their view of heaven is just a fulfillment of base, sensual lust. That's, that's their heaven. That's what it is. This, that's not heaven at all. This reigning with Christ over the entire inheritance forever and ever, that's the real heaven. That's the one that John saw. John saw Zion, the city of our God built for the habitation of God out of Zion the perfection of beauty God hath shined Amen. the only things in that city are the things that are designed for service to him mm -hmm. only things that please and glorify him are there his will alone is done there only his servants will be there and they will reign in the light of his glory forever and ever all the provisions needed for our reign will, will be supplied for us there. <clears throat> it will be a reign without any curse. We will reign while seeing his face, reign with his name in our foreheads, a reign where there is no night, reign with the full light of the glory of God shining upon us continually, reigning forever and ever. Now with promises like that, why would any man... He's got to hear it first. But why would any man want to die in his sins and go to the lake of fire with promises like this? <clears throat> why would anyone prefer the lake of fire over such abundant mercy and grace? <clears throat> this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Amen. Not just life in this world, but even in the world to come. This, this life that we just read about, that I've been speaking of, this, this life is in his son. <clears throat> I want to leave you with this word from John's first epistle. <clears throat> Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Amen. Amen. Amen.